Um, thank you, uh, but your enthusiasm is truly uh, misplaced. <laughs> I think this is like the fifth year in a row that we've done this. And I think the first year we did it, Chris realized in over Thanksgiving break that he hadn't planned anything for the Christmas chapel and <laughs> kind of asked me if I would just do this at the last minute. And uh, I did, reluctantly. And I think like three people on their way out the door told him, well, that wasn't as bad as I expected. And based on that feedback, <laughs> this has become an annual ritual um, uh, to which we subject the students. It's the penance some of you pay for having waited till the very end to get your 25 credits in or whatever it is that you're trying to get. So here we are. Uh, this is Ben Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> who will add sheen and gloss and a lot. Yes, just like that, to this otherwise pedantic experience. So <sighs> here we are. I hope you brought your cocoa. And we're going to start with the literary work from which the movie was based, or probably the other way around. This is Home Alone, which I can't imagine any of you has not seen yet. It's been out for a long time. But just in case you haven't, I'm going to spoil all of it for you. So close your ears if you don't know the story and don't want to be surprised. Thank you. All right, so here we go. We can go ahead and start. All right, so we're creating a mood of excitement over there, Mr. Accompanist, because it was three nights before Christmas and the McAllister family was getting ready to leave for vacation. Everyone was busy packing. Everyone except Kevin. Who was busy getting into trouble? Go straight to bed, his mother demanded. That's enough trouble for one day. Lying in bed, Kevin could hear voices and laughter coming from downstairs. Everyone was having fun without him. I hope I never see my family again, Kevin whispered. I wish I was home alone. Now we interrupt this reading for a, an academic word of encouragement and advice. Not only is Kevin displaying bad behavior, but he is using bad grammar. <laughs> According to Grammarly, use were if the state of being is in no way the current reality. Well, in no way was Kevin's reality that he was home alone, at least not at that point. So he should have said, I wish I were home alone. A little grammar for you folks, no extra charge. Your parents will not be billed. <laughs> the next morning, the house was very, very quiet. No one was shouting. No one was running. No one was telling Kevin to hurry up and eat his breakfast. No one was home. Finally, Kevin realized what had happened. I made my family disappear! For the first time ever, Kevin had the house all to himself. He raced up and down the halls. He jumped on all the beds. He ate a giant a giant ice cream sundae for breakfast. After watching hours of television, he searched through his brother's private stuff and rode a toboggan down a giant mountain. Ah! He even tried his father's aftershave lotion. This was not a good idea. Some of you guys will experience this in a couple of years. It stings, it stings. Word to the wise, just be careful out there. It's a crazy world we live in. 
but sometimes it was scary to be all alone. Kevin was especially afraid of his next door neighbor. Old man Marley was the scariest person who lived on their block. And that night, Kevin heard whispers outside the living room window. Burglars were snooping around his house. You see, Marv said, most of the houses on this street are empty. Everyone is away for the holidays. Perfect, Harry said. We'll come back tomorrow night and steal everything. Kevin was so scared. He dialed 911, but the telephone didn't work because his parents had been too cheap to get him a cell phone. The wires had been damaged in a snowstorm. <laughs> After hiding under his parents' bed for a long time, Kevin decided that he was being silly. Only a wimp would be hiding, and I can't be a wimp. I'm the grown-up of this house, and I need to act like one. The next day was Christmas Eve, and Kevin had plenty of grown-up work to do. He walked to the grocery store and bought food. He put his clothes in the washing machine, being careful to put the reds in with everything else so that they would run all over the new clothes. He decorated a Christmas tree, and he hung Christmas stockings for his parents and brothers and sisters. I miss you guys, he whispered. I wish you would come back. Kevin's family always went to church on Christmas Eve, so that's what Kevin did too. After the service ended, he saw his scary next door neighbor, old man Marley, sitting nearby. You don't have to be afraid, Mr. Marley said. The kids in the neighborhood have lots of spooky stories about me, but they're not true. In fact, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? After they sang for a while, Kevin realized that Mr. Marley was in fact a very nice man. Are you visiting anyone for Christmas? Kevin asked. No, Mr. Marley said. I miss my family and I'd like to see them, but my son and I are fighting. I said some angry words that I didn't mean. Some uh, angry words in a minor key, please. There you go. Mm, that's it. Yep. One more. One more. Ooh. Mr. Marley actually cursed at his son. That wasn't very nice of him. Kevin knew exactly how Mr. Marley felt. Kevin remembered wishing his family would disappear, but he hadn't really meant it. You should try talking to your son, Kevin said. Maybe I will, Mr. Marley said. When Kevin left the church, it was already dark. The burglars would be coming soon. He ran all the way home. Kevin made a plan that was full, and I mean full, of booby traps. You can see them. Christmas ornaments, ice, tar, toy cars, glue, feathers, fan, etc. What did he do? Well, he scattered toy cars and smeared tar on the basement steps. He made a big pile of feathers and hid sharp ornaments under the windowsills. He sprayed water on the front steps and tied paint cans to ropes. He stretched a tripwire through the hallway and built an escape route to his treehouse. At 9 o'clock, Marv and Harry returned to the McAllister's house, ready to steal everything inside. They didn't know that Kevin had sprayed water all over the steps or that the water had frozen into slick, slippery ice. The burglars stumbled into all of Kevin's traps. Yuck! Yow! Wah! Ew! Marv and Harry slipped on the toy cars and were knocked over by the paint cans. Kevin escaped through his bedroom window and ran next door to his neighbor's house. Unfortunately, Marv and Harry were close behind. Now we've got you, kid, Harry said. 
But then Mr. Marley arrived just in time. Whack, whack. He bonked the burglars with his snow shovel and called the police. Then he brought Kevin home. That night, Kevin left a note for Santa Claus along with some milk and cookies. He couldn't wait for Christmas morning. And in case you can't, well, I guess you can probably. Anyway, the, the note says, Dear Santa, I don't need any presents. Just bring back my family. Love, Kevin McAllister. <laughs> when he woke up the next day, Kevin rushed into the living room. Mom, Dad, is anyone here? No one answered him. But just then, he heard a familiar voice. Kevin, is that you? His mother was home. I missed you so much, he said, giving her a giant hug. I missed you too, she said. Where are the others, Kevin asked. The front door flew open, and there they were, his father, his brothers, and sisters. Everybody was home at last. Are you okay, his father asked. I'm just happy you're all back, Kevin said. Merry Christmas. And just at that moment, there was a knock on the door. And when they opened it up, staff members from the Department of Children and Family Services <laughs> came to haul Kevin's parents off to jail for gross negligence and conduct unbecoming of parents. Oh, I'm sorry. It says here, do not read the epilogue to small children. Oh, I'm sorry. But speaking of that, Adam, did Chris authorize this? Was this like Chris's idea? Chris gave the okay to read this with this absolutely horrible ending where the parents just walk in after being gone for two days and just assume everything's okay. What kind of ridiculously stupid parenting is that? All right, well, Chris isn't here to defend himself, but that's okay. All right, hang on just a second there if you would here. Forgive me, I know I'm not supposed to use my phone at times like this, but uh, hey Google. Yes. What would you like me to do? Send Sari Lash a text. What do you want the message to say? Sari, I have serious concerns about your new husband and his prospects as a father. <laughs> Please come and see me before trying to get pregnant. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Dr. Anderson. Do you want me to send it? Send, yes. <laughs> Some more cocoa. <sighs> In contrast, let's read about some good parents. All right. Love you, Chris, but no, seriously, some real concerns. <laughs> All right. This is from the Jesus Storybook Bible. Every story whispers his name, written by Sally Lloyd-Jones and illustrated by someone named Jago or Jago or Iago, I suppose. A one-named artist like Madonna or Lecrae or something like that. All right, here we are. He's here in the nativity from Luke 1 to 2. Everything was ready. The moment God had been waiting for was here at last. God was coming to help his people, just as he promised in the beginning. But how would he come? What would, be, what would he be like? What would he do? Mountains would have bowed down. Seas would have roared. Trees would have clapped their hands but the earth held its breath. 
as silent as snow falling, he came in. And when no one was looking in the darkness, he came. There was a young girl who was engaged to a man named Joseph. Joseph was the great, 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 great grandson of King David. One morning, this girl was minding her own business when suddenly a great warrior of light appeared right there in her bedroom. He was Gabriel, and he was an angel, a special messenger from heaven. When she saw the tall, shining man standing there, Mary was frightened. You don't need to be scared, Gabriel said. God is very happy with you. Mary looked around to see if perhaps he was talking to someone else. Mary, Gabriel said, and he laughed with such gladness that Mary's eyes filled with sudden tears. Mary, you're going to have a baby, a little boy. You will call him Jesus. He is God's own son. He's the one. He's the rescuer. The God who flung planets into space and kept them whirling around and around. The God who made the universe with just a word. The one who could do anything at all was making himself small and coming down as a baby. Wait, God was sending a baby to rescue the world? But it's too wonderful, Mary said, and felt her heart beating hard. How can it be true? Is anything too wonderful for God? Gabriel asked. So Mary trusted God more than what her eyes could see. And she believed. So the theological principle there is that Mary was walking by faith and not by sight. I am God's servant, she said. Whatever God says, I will do. Sure enough, it was just as the angel had said. Nine months later, Mary was almost ready to have her baby. Now Mary and Joseph had to take a trip to Bethlehem, the town King David was from. But when they reached the little town, they found every room was full. Every bed was taken. Go away, the innkeepers told them. There isn't any place for you. Where would they stay? Soon Mary's baby would come. They couldn't find anywhere except an old tumble-down stable. So they stayed where the cows and the donkeys and the horses stayed. And there in the stable amongst the chickens and the donkeys and the cows in the quiet of the night, God gave the world his wonderful gift. The baby that would change the world was born, his baby son. Mary and Joseph wrapped him up to keep him warm. They made a soft bed of straw and used the animal's feeding trough as his cradle. And they gazed in wonder at God's great gift, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Mary and Joseph named him Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God has come to live with us because, of course, he had. The light of the whole world, the story of the shepherds from Luke 2. That same night, in amongst the other stars, suddenly a bright new star appeared. Of all the stars in the dark vaulted heavens, this one shone clearer. It blazed in the night and made the other stars look pale beside it. God put it there when his baby son was born to be like a spotlight shining on him, lighting up the darkness, showing people the way to him. You see, God was like a new daddy. He couldn't keep the good news to himself. He'd been waiting all these long years for this moment, and now he wanted to tell everyone. So he pulled out all the stops. He'd sent an angel to tell Mary the good news. He'd put a special star in the sky to show where his boy was. And now he was going to send a big choir of angels to sing his happy song to the world. He's here. He's come. Go and see him, my little boy. Now, where would you send your splendid choir? To a big concert hall, maybe? Or a palace, perhaps? 
God sent his to a little hillside outside a little town in the middle of the night. He sent all those angels to sing for a raggedy old bunch of shepherds watching their sheep outside Bethlehem. In those days, remember, people used to laugh at shepherds and say they were smelly and call them other rude names, which I can't possibly mention here. You see, people thought shepherds were nobodies, just scruffy old riffraff. But God must have thought shepherds were very important indeed because they're the ones he chose to tell the good news to first. That night, some shepherds were out in the open fields, warming themselves by a campfire, when suddenly the sheep darted. They were frightened by something. The olive trees rustled. What was that? A wing beat? They turned around. Standing in front of them was a huge warrior of light, blazing in the darkness. Don't be afraid of me, the bright shining man said. I haven't come to hurt you. I've come to bring you happy news for everyone everywhere. Today in David's town in Bethlehem, God's son has been born. You can go and see him. He is sleeping in a manger. Behind the angel, they saw a strange glowing cloud. Except it wasn't a cloud. It was angels. Troops and troops of angels armed with light. And they were singing a beautiful song. Glory to God. To God be fame and honor and all our hoorays. Then as quickly as they appeared, the angels left. The shepherds stamped out their fire, left their sheep, raced down the grassy hill, through the gates of Bethlehem, down the narrow cobble streets, through a courtyard, down some steps, 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 past an inn, round a corner, through a hedge, until at last they reached a tumble-down stable. They caught their breath. Then quietly, they tiptoed inside. They knelt on the dirt floor. They had heard about this promised child, and now he was here. Heaven's son, the maker of the stars. A baby sleeping in his mother's arms. This baby would be like that bright star shining in the sky that night, a light to light up the whole world, chasing away darkness, helping people to see. And the darker the night got, the brighter the star would shine. The King of All Kings, the story of the three wise men from Matthew 2. Far away in the east, three clever men saw the very same star, the star that God had put in the sky when Jesus was born. They knew it was a sign. A baby king had been born. They had been waiting for the star. They knew it would come. He's here, they shouted. He's here. And I'm sure if you'd been there, you would have heard them laughing and dancing and singing until the sun came up. At dawn, they packed up their camels and wrapped gifts for the baby. They brought their most precious treasures of all, frankincense, gold, and myrrh. Special, sparkly, lovely smelling, gleaming things. Just right for a king. The three wise men, actually, if you'd met them, you'd have thought they were kings because they were so rich and clever and important looking, set off. They rode their camels across endless deserts, up steep, steep mountains, down into deep, deep valleys, through raging rivers, over grassy plains, night and day and day and night, for hours that turned into days that turned into weeks, that turned into months and months until at last they reached Jerusalem. Jerusalem was by far the most important city for miles, for miles around, and as anyone could tell you, that's where a palace would be, and kings are born in palaces, so that's where they went. But they were in for a surprise. They went to see King Herod. Surely he'd know where this baby was, but he didn't. In fact, he didn't like the sound of a new king. It made him cross. He didn't want anyone to be king except him. But Herod's advisors told the three wise men what was written in their books, what God had said about the baby king. Go to Bethlehem. That's where you'll find him. 
Suddenly, the star they had seen in the east started moving again, showing them the way. So the three wise men followed the star out of the big city along the road into the little town of Bethlehem. They followed the star through the streets of Bethlehem, out of the nice part of town, through the not so nice part of town, into the really not nice at all part of town, down a little dirt track until it stopped right over a little house. But wait, it wasn't a palace and there weren't any guards or servants or flags or red carpets or trumpets or anything. Did they get it wrong? Or was this what God meant? Sure enough, in that little house, there sitting on his mother's knee, they found him, the baby king. The three men knelt before the little king. They took off their rich royal turbans and gleaming golden crowns. They bowed their noble heads to the ground and gave him their sparkling treasures. The journey that had begun so many centuries before had led three wise men here to a little town, to a little house, to a little king. To the king God had promised David all those years before. But this child was a new kind of king. Though he was the prince of heaven, he had become poor. Though he was the mighty God, he had become a helpless baby. This king hadn't come to be the boss. He had come to be a servant. We are going to close this chapel by reading and then singing the carol, Silent Night. But before we do this, a little background information. Some of you probably know this story, but just in case you don't, it'll help give it a little bit of context. Silent Night, or Stille Nacht, was composed in 1818 in Orberndorf by Salzburg, Austria. Legend has it that on Christmas Eve, Joseph Moore, the Catholic curate of the town, found that mice had chewed away part of the church organ. Obviously, rogue contemporary worship fanatic mice who don't like organs. meaning that would be out of action for the Midnight Mass. Moore desperately needed something for his congregation to sing, so he wrote Silent Night, simple verses inspired by a visit he had made that day to a mother and her sick baby. When he had written the lyrics, he ran round to his friend Franz Gruber, an organist, and asked him to write some music for it. The new hymn was performed that night at midnight to music from Gruber's guitar. Weeks later, Carl Morocker arrived to repair the organ. When he finished, he stepped back to let Gruber test the instrument. Gruber began playing Silent Night, and Morocker liked it so much that he took it back to his own village. There, two well-known families of singers, the Rainers and the Strassers, heard it. Silent Night became a core part of their Christmas season performance. In 1834, it was performed by the Strassers for King Frederick William IV of Prussia, and he then ordered his cathedral choir to sing it every Christmas Eve. Silent Night has since been translated into more than 200 languages, including English, in 1858. During the truce of the First World War on December 25, 1914, it was sung by soldiers on both sides of the trenches. That's pretty cool. Whether the tale of its origin is true or not, Silent Night is one of the world's most best beloved carols today. And so we begin. Silent Night, Holy Night. All is calm, all is bright. 
round yon virgin, mother and child. Holy infant, so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. Silent night, holy night. Shepherds quake at the sight. Glories stream from heaven afar. Heavenly hosts sing alleluia. Christ the Savior is born. Christ the Savior is born. Silent night, holy night, Son of God loves pure light. Radiant beams from thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Round yon virgin, mother and child, holy infant, so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. I'm not a hymnologist, but I think part of the reason this carol remains so popular is because to whatever extent it was the case back then, and I'm sure it was, it is infinitely more the case now. That our world very rarely feels peaceful. And if we, unlike Mary, choose to walk by sight and not by faith, we will not feel very peaceful very often. It takes discipline. It takes what Paul refers to as the continual renewing of our mind to allow ourselves to trust in a God that we cannot see, to read words that are in some cases thousands of years old and to believe that they have relevance for us in the year 2019. But when we do, when we allow faith to transcend our current reality and to remind ourselves that God is equal parts transcendent and imminent. He is a God of wonders beyond our galaxy on the one hand and he is a friend who is only a prayer away on the other. Holding on to both ends of that theological stick helps us to sing this song year after year after year with confidence. As we close the service today, there are no doubt some of you who are not feeling all that peaceful. And so I would encourage you as we sing this wonderful carol, almost 200 years old now, that you would embody in whatever manner you wish this great text that speaks to the truth that we can find peace in the midst of a world that appears anything but peaceful when we are focusing on the right things. And every year it gets more difficult to do that because we get bombarded by more things.
all the time. So turn the dang phone off every once in a while. Put it away. And allow the Lord to speak peace to your soul. Would you stand, please? Are we ready? Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round young virgin, mother and child. Just the voices. Let me hear some harmonies now. Silent night, holy night, son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy. flat now here we go and so on your finals, travel home safely, go in peace.